On behalf of Dairy Xnet, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Current Research in Genomic Selection. I'm Donna Amaral Phillips, Extension Dairy Specialist and Project Team Leader for Dairy Xnet, and I'd like to welcome you today for our presentation. Today's presentation will have two speakers, Dr. Joe Dalton, who will talk about a research trial in titled Improving the Fertility of Dairy Cattle Using Translational Genomics. And we will also have Dr. Jose Santos talking about genetic select, genomic selection for improved fertility of dairy cows with emphasis on cyclicity and, and pregnancy. So today's webinar is um, recorded and you can view this at any time. We also have other archived webinars and we encourage you to actually view those also. We also have um, a way of be, for you to be notified as far as upcoming webinars, new articles, or other great dairy resources that we have. You can follow us on Facebook. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter or also follow us on Twitter. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker for today. Basically today we are going to talk about genomic tools for predicting reproductive performance. Our first speaker, Dr. Joe Dalton, is a professor and extension dairy specialist in the animal and veterinary science at the University of Idaho. He received his PhD from Virginia Tech and he is currently um, at University of Idaho. Overall, his research program in applied male and female reproductive physiology focuses on factors that are important to increasing the efficiency of AI in cattle. His extension program also emphasizes the impact or enhancement of reproductive efficiency in cattle. He has given presentations throughout the United States and various foreign countries and is also the past president of the Dairy Cattle Reproductive Council. Today he's going to talk about a research trial, a research program that they have on improving dairy cattle fertility using translational genomics. With that, please welcome Joe Dalton. Thank you very much, Donna. Uh, as you mentioned, we are going to talk about uh, trying to improve dairy cattle fertility using translational genomics. This is a collaborative uh, effort, a grant that was received from the USDA. Uh, and we have uh, on this first slide USDA as a collaborator along with Missouri, Washington State University, University of Florida, and the University of Idaho. On this graph here we have on the left axis we have milk production. On the uh, horizontal axis we have years from 1950 to 2010. And then on the right hand axis we have fertility and on this graph we're showing it as daughter pregnancy rate. In the black line going from left to right and going up at a steep incline, we see milk production has increased over time from 1950 till uh, 2010. And this we all know very well. Uh, we have uh, selected for milk production. Uh, we have uh, uh, instituted many different management strategies that have allowed us to increase milk production at, at, at quite a, a very good rate over the years. Unfortunately, what has also happened is we have had fertility decline over those years. And this is shown in the blue line going from the upper left to the lower right. But there's good news because in recent years, fertility has rebounded as we have learned more not only about the animal, uh, whether it's genetics or genomics, but also as we have instituted various management strategies to increase fertility. What we would like to do is we would like to further increase the blue line up towards the right-hand axis, continue to increase fertility. So the question, a uh, very simple question is, how do we increase fertility? Well, one of the ways that we're proposing to increase fertility is through something called genomic selection. And essentially, genomic selection, as we're talking about it today, is a marker-assisted selection using the entire genome, all of the information that that animal carries with her or him, all of the genetic information we want to interrogate and find out if they received the gene sets that we are interested in. And this is possible due to increased feasibility or it is 
increased feasibility due to sequencing of the bovine genome. So the bovine genome has been sequenced, and there are new methods being developed to efficiently genotype animals. The difficulty lies in that marker discovery. Finding these markers that are important requires carefully phenotyped populations. And what that means is we have to have excellent records, excellent records, so that we can associate a phenotype, high fertility, for example, with a genotype, which would be what is the genetic code of animals that have high fertility. Now, genomic selection can be based on either single nucleotide polymorphisms, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, or something called copy number variation. A single nucleotide polymorphism is a change at one location along the code of DNA. As, we're, as we can see here, uh, on the bottom we have going from left to right, we have TT, and then we have GGAT. And if we look at the second panel, below it, we have TT, G, A, A, T. So we've had a single change in the code that allows us to identify a difference between one animal and another animal. And how we do this is these SNPs could, can be outside of the gene and they can be literally just markers for something that goes on next to the gene, or they can be a causative SNP, which is what we would really like to look for, what we'd really like to find, and those can be in the gene, and those can actually change the amount of a protein that's produced, for example, or it could actually change an amino acid sequence in the protein that is being produced. Again, we're looking for a single change in the uh, DNA, in the code, almost like a road sign that alerts us that something is coming up. So our research project, funded by the USDA, is an integrated research and extension project. Our long-term goal is increasing fertility of dairy cattle. Our research appoint, uh, approach excuse me, is to develop novel genetic markers of fertility in both heifers and lactating cows, and we would like to determine the effects of specific SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms on daughter pregnancy rate and embryo development. Now, being that this is an integrated research and extension project, we have an extension approach, and that extension approach includes dissemination, demonstration, evaluation, and documentation of the impact of using genetic selection tools to increase fertility on herd management and dairy profitability. And on the bottom here, from left to right, you see all the different collaborators from the uh, various institutions. So our first objective, as I mentioned, is to develop novel markers of fertility. And the approach we're using is to look at records and with Holstein heifers and primiparous cows, first lactation cows, we will fertility classify these animals based on pregnancy outcome to AI. So heifers have to have a normal reproductive tract, no record of disease, and display standing estrus before AI. For cows to be included, they must have a normal reproductive tract, uncomplicated previous pregnancy, no record of diseases before or after AI, and display standing estrus before AI. This, if you'll remember, this is the phenotype that we're looking for. The records have to be excellent for this to work. 
And our fertility phenotypes, if you will, are shown on the bottom of this slide. We have three of them. The first one, animals will be classified as highly fertile if they become pregnant as a result of the first artificial insemination. Animals will be classified as subfertile if they become pregnant only after the fourth artificial insemination. And then we will have an infertile phenotype, which would be animals that are never pregnant to AI. And those animals are removed from the herd as a result. So on this next slide shown here, we have preliminary data of a genome-wide association study of fertility in Holstein heifers. And as we look at this slide, we can see a graph that has, along the horizontal axis, numbers 1 through 28, along with the letter X. And we can see chromosome is the label for that horizontal axis. So what we're actually looking at is a plot. It's called a Manhattan plot from left to right of SNPs that are on each chromosome. And as we look up the colors, we see a line going left to right that appears to be blue or black, and then another line that goes left to right that appears to be red or pink. And in between that, I have written moderate association. Those dots in between the red and pink and the blue-black line are considered SNPs that are moderately associated with fertility. However, if we look above that line and we can see a strong association printed, we can see that there's a dot above chromosome 4 and a dot above chromosome 6. What this indicates is that these two SNPs are strongly associated with fertility in dairy heifers. Again, this is preliminary data, and I have to reiterate that these animals were phenotyped looking at artificial insemination breeding records, number one. We had about 470 animals that were in the high fertility phenotype and about 188, 189 that were infertile, never pregnant. And again, what this graph is showing us is that the high fertile animals tend to have these markers, if you will, on chromosome 4 and chromosome 6 that we have labeled strong association. So we have many more samples that we have to run through the genome-wide association study to confirm this, but we are excited with this preliminary data. Objective two is to determine effects of SNPs on daughter pregnancy rate and embryo development. The first portion of this is to identify and genotype bulls with high or low DPR. And the second portion of this is to identify SNPs in genes known to be involved in reproduction that are related to DPR. So this is specifically looking at genes that we already know are involved in reproduction. And we want to search for new SNPs that are in there that are related to daughter pregnancy rate. This is ongoing research also. And what we see in this next slide is that 40 SNPs have been identified that are related to daughter reproduction, daughter pregnancy rate specifically. The take-home message from these 40 SNPs is that 29 of these 40 SNPs were not significantly related to production traits. So what this means, what this suggests, is that selection for fertility without negative selection for milk yield is possible, which is where we want to go. We don't want to sacrifice gains in milk production over the years for fertility. So the implications 
of this information is that SNPs can be used to improve genetic selection and to better understand the physiological basis for fertility. And incidentally, these SNPs are available on a SNP chip for producers to use, and we are getting more and more data on this as we speak. The remaining two objectives focus on the integrated portion or the extension portion with the research. Objective three is to evaluate the efficiency and profitability of increasing fertility in dairy cattle using genetic selection tools. This is being done through com computer modeling, working with producers and modeling their data, and then also in the development of web-based decision support tools. So producers can then put in their own information and have an estimate of what might be the results. And then our final objective is to transfer science-based information to dairy producers, managers, allied industry, everyone interested in increasing fertility with strategies to improve fertility using novel genomic information and tools. This, everything that we would find would be available to dairy producers to use to increase fertility uh, in their herd. And to disseminate this information, to gain more information from producers, we have a series of dairy cattle genomics workshops planned for 2016. They will be in late November and early December in Jerome, Idaho, Sunnyside, Washington, Stephenville, Texas, Okeechobee, Florida, and Tulare, California. As we've talked about some of the preliminary data, we still have to realize we have a long way to go. We have a couple of more years on this grant. We have a lot of samples to do a genome-wide assay on, be it heifers or cows. But our expected outcomes for the grant are better genomic tools for predicting reproduction, increased reliability of estimates of breeding values for reproductive traits, and more rapid progress in improving dairy cow fertility. And what you see on the, on the bottom there is the graph that I showed from my first slide, and you can see a red arrow. And the goal here is to increase fertility. And with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in, and I appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you. Uh, we're excited with this data, and we hope that this data will be available to you so that you will be able to increase the fertility of your herd in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe, um, for your excellent presentation on where you are in that particular grant. Our second speaker today is Jose Santos. And he is going to talk about a companion type of a grant. Um, it's a separate grant, but it probably um, relates very similar to um, the one that Joe just talked about. But it's talking about genomic selection for improved fertility of dairy cows with the emphasis on cyclicity and pregnancy. Jose Santos is a research foundation professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida. He has a DVM and a PhD and he did a clinical residency in dairy production medicine in the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of California, Davis. Um, he spent eight years there on faculty in the School of Veterinary Medicine before he moved to the University of Florida. His current research and extension program is in dairy cattle nutrition and reproduction, with his primary research emphasis is on the focus of the interactions between nutrition and reproduction and the methods to improve postpartum health and fertility of dairy cows. And we're very honored to have you to here today, Jose, to talk a little bit about this grant and where you're going and what results you have preliminary. Well, uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, I hope you all can hear me well. Uh, as uh, Joe already alluded to, we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, similarities, and as you will see in my presentation, and this is a joint effort within each of those grants, but also between the two uh, grants that have been funded by uh, the USDA. 
I want to acknowledge uh, the collaborators in this project that you can see here in this first slide. Uh, we have a team of people from numerous universities working in different areas of this project. Uh, Joe already showed you a similar slide, uh, probably a more updated slide, uh, that has illustrated that uh, we've been very successful at increasing milk production. Uh, and in fact, the rolling herd average of the U.S. dairy cattle population for 2015 has surpassed uh, 22,000 pounds of milk. Uh, concurrent with this increase in milk yield, we also experience a decline in reproductive performance uh, in the dairy cattle population, which wasn't until the uh, early 2000s that we've seen a stop to this decline and a uh, uh, change in the direction uh, with an increase in the genetic value for daughter fertility as it's been uh, shown before. So uh, a big component of the grant that we are working on is to further enhance uh, reproductive performance by adding additional genetic gain uh, by identifying molecular markers that are either associated or actually causative markers that influence uh, important traits relative to reproduction. Now, obviously, we can look at extremes, and these are probably uh, the best examples for um, milk production. Uh, the two cows listed here, one has the world record for milk yield in a given lactation. The second one has the world record milk yield uh, for lifetime production. And obviously, this major development did not happen uh, by random chance. Obviously, uh, genetic selection concurrent with all the improvements we've made in cow husbandry, nutrition, health, has resulted in uh, phenomenal production and major outliers in the population. So as part of the project that we've been working on, we want to study cows uh, in different environments and identify uh, those outliers for fertility uh, based on a series of traits that we've been collecting so we can identify potential causative mutations in their genome that distinguish populations of cows that have very high compared with populations of cows that have very low fertility. And I will uh, explain a little bit of that during my presentation. Now, one of the focus of our grant is not only to identify markers for fertility, but also tag along and uh, uh, identify markers that influence peripartum health because we believe that a big driver of uh, poor fertility in dairy cattle population is the high morbidity that cows usually experience. And here is just to illustrate uh, when cows are diagnosed with a very common disease, in this case is metritis, which typically affects cows in the first two weeks, um, usually no later than the third week postpartum, as you can see in this histogram. But if we look at the disease that do not affect the reproductive tract, in other words, the non-uterine disease in this case, you can also see that most of them occur very early in lactation. And because these diseases have inflammatory nature and they occur early in lactation, they have a long-lasting effect in cows. So it is our assumption that, based on the current knowledge and literature, that if we are able to minimize the incidence of disease through genomic selection, we'll also capitalize on improvements in dairy cattle fertility because there is a phenotypic association and very likely a genotypic association between those traits. Now, many, many cows experience disease, and we've quantified that about 30 to 35 percent of the cows affect by disease, those usually occur in the first weeks of lactation. And in fact, almost 80 percent of the diagnosis of disease will occur in the first three weeks postpartum. So we have and a lot of effort identifying those problems in their lactation, as you will see with our preliminary results. Now, there are many ways by which disease can affect reproduction. Some of them are directly related to uh, reproductive traits. So here's an example in which we evaluate embryo quality at the very early stages of pregnancy on day six in cows that were initially after calving diagnosed with disease or not diagnosed with disease. So 
So cows who are assessed for uh, uh, common disease such as retained placenta, metritis, mastitis, lameness, uh, digestive product uh, problems, or respiratory problems. Then those cows were synchronized, and six days after insemination, we flush the uteri of those cows and evaluate a few aspects of embryo development. So here you can see that cows that had disease in early lactation had a smaller proportion of fertilization based on the proportion of embryos that had undergone a initial division or cleavage. They also had smaller proportion of live embryos or high-quality embryos. This indicates to us that disease is already affecting embryo development very early on in gestation. When we only look at the fertilized eggs, in other words, we take away the non-fertilized uh, oocytes, we can see that the same pattern still occur. Disease is having a negative effect on uh, embryo quality in those cows. And obviously, this negative effect can perpetuate and reduce pregnancy that usually would be diagnosed uh, 28 to 35 days after breeding. And in fact, if you look at this data set, you will see that healthy cows, in other words, those that uh, do not develop clinical disease, they have very high fertility. About half of the population became pregnant at first insemination in this uh, database whereas cows that developed one or more than one disease had a marked depression in pregnancy. And you can see that it doesn't really matter what the exact disease problem was. Almost all of them were statistically associated with a depression in pregnancy of first insemination. So the question then arises, can we select cows for improved reproduction? Can we combine uh, in our genetic selection programs fertility? And the answer, obviously, most of you know uh, it is yes, because we've been doing this. However, we need to be aware that the low heritability uh, for a lot of the uh, reproductive uh, traits usually makes this uh, speed at which genetic selection uh, improve that particular trait uh, to be slow. So heritability, which is how much of that phenotypic variation is caused by genetic variation in the population, is usually quite high for production traits, usually above 25 to 30 percent, but it's somewhat low for uh, fitness or fertility traits, uh, except for some of them and probably because for some of them we know a little bit more of the potential mechanism. Uh, so, for instance, if we look at the current traits that we evaluate, such as cow conception rate, daughter pregnancy rate, heritability is within 3 to 5 percent. Whereas if we look at resumption of first postpartum ovulation, uh, heritability now increases to 15 to as much as 30 percent, depending upon the population in which uh, uh, the study was uh, conducted. So there are traits in reproduction that can uh, ha make greater progress through genetic and genomic selection if we're capable of identifying the markers that are segregated in the populations that are more suited for uh, uh, improved reproduction uh, based on those uh, particular traits that are being selected. Now, we have made progress in terms of selecting cattle, particularly because we implemented productive life and daughter pregnancy rate. But if we look more carefully at our progress in 2011, we decreased Kevin interval by about three weeks. And this is why daughter pregnancy rate has really uh, improved. But we still have not seen a similar improvement in pregnancy per insemination. So, there's still a lot of work to be done such that pregnancy per insemination on dairy farms uh, will surpass the current average of 33 or 34 percent, and pregnancy loss after a given pre uh, insemination will decrease uh, below what we typically see anywhere between 12 and 18 percent of the pregnancies are lost at some point after 35 days of gestation. 
Now, there are several examples that uh, can uh, illustrate the fact that we can combine selection for fertility with selection for productive traits. And here is one of them in which I plotted uh, different sires, either genomic or proven bulls, that have uh, considerably high milk PTA, at least uh, 600 pounds of milk, 250 kilograms, and have daughter pregnancy rate PTA above 1.5, which are those on the top right quadrant. Okay? So this tells us that, yes, there are sires in the hosting population that will carry uh, the good genes for the traits that we are interested in, such as production, but they will also carry the good genes for traits that we're interested in terms of fitness and fertility. Now let me show you uh, uh, some examples. So here are the uh, phenotypic and genetic, correla genetic relationships between uh, milk yield and daughter fertility, in this case, uh, daughter pregnancy rate. And you can see that we've made a considerable phenotypic increase in milk production in the graph in the left side. We made considerable uh, genetic progress based on the uh, 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 genetic merit of the uh, dairy cattle population today. We can also see that we made much greater phenotypic improvement in daughter fertility than we've made genetic progress. Part of that is because we applied management tools that improve reproduction, such as better insemination technique, asterisk ovulation synchronization programs, better postpartum health, things that accelerate pregnancy on a farm. But I'll show you an example of a farm that has implemented genomic selection very intensively from the male side and the female side relative to the average increment observed in the hosting population today. And we envision that after completion of the grants that are being funded by the USDA, more and more producers will implement such tools to further increase genetic selection in their herd. So here's an example of a farm that has implemented genomic selection uh, from the early years. And you can see that the rate of gain of this particular farm label NFH has been 0.2 percent per year since the year of 2004, compared to the average of the U.S. dairy cattle population of 0.07 percent per year. In other words, about a threefold increase in uh, daughter fertility gain uh, compared to the average gain of the U.S. dairy cattle population. If we look at lifetime net merit in the same situation, we see a gain, a differential gain of an additional $231 uh, uh, for the heifers that were born in 2013 in this particular farm compared to the heifers born in 2013 in the average dairy farm of the United States. If we look at another trait, such as productive life, we see the same situation. In other words, combining uh, aggressive uh, genetic through genomic selection uh, increases the rate of genetic gain, not only for production traits, but also for fertility and uh, uh, survival traits, in this case. So let me tell you a little bit about the grant we've been working on, which is very complementary to the one that you just heard about from uh, Dr. Joe Dow. Uh, this is the title of our grant, Genomic Selection for Improved Fertility of Dairy Cow with Emphasis on Cyclicity and Pregnancy. And the reason why we have this title is because we put a lot of emphasis on identifying those phenotypic traits in uh, uh, cows in numerous farms. And I'll show you some of the results that we've had. So the objectives of our grant is to identify molecular markers for genomic selection to improve fertility of dairy cattle. It's exactly the same main objective of the previous grant. So we have developed a fertility database with genotypes and phenotypes based on what we call direct measures of fertility. In, in our case, we're studying hosting cows. And those direct measures are interval from calving to first ovulation, pregnancy per insemination, pregnancy loss, and also all the other measures that we collect. We are in the process of identifying <coughs> SNPs associated with those fertility traits and conducting genome-wide 
uh, uh, association analysis to identify what markers are linked to improved or reduced reproductive performance. Uh, once this process is complete, we're going to generate genomic estimated breeding values that can be applied for selection for improved fertility such that those markers will be incorporated into the platforms that are available today uh, in, in the market. And it will be an additional value combined with all the other SNPs uh, to identify additional traits. Uh, we're also working uh, on extending knowledge to the dairy industry through this sequential uh, webinars and seminars that we've been doing in collaboration uh, uh, with uh, the group of Joe Dalton, and also educate students on animal health, reproduction, and genetics. So here's just to illustrate what we found in terms of phenotypic responses in the populations of cows that we've studied. We uh, uh, visit, uh, we collect data from uh, almost 12,000 cows and 16 herds representing seven states in four different regions of the United States, in which we visit farms two to three times a week to characterize those problems. And you can see that a large portion of the cow population is affected uh, by disease. In other words, 45% of the cows have a problem. Okay. Within this population of cows, we uh, uh, select groups based on a mathematical model that have high fertility, which are cows that became pregnant, uh, and they maintain pregnancy up to 60 days of gestation, in which we call these cows as having a very high reproductive index based on this uh, uh, mathematical model. But we also identified low fertility cows, almost 1,800 cows, and this uh, a little over uh, 2,600 cows have been uh, genotyped to uh, identify potential differences between these two populations of cattle. So this, pro this uh, uh, portion of the project is ongoing. We have not completed that yet, uh, but we hope to complete uh, by the end of uh, this year. So once this is complete, we'll identify those markers and we'll validate that in a new pool of cows in collaboration with people uh, in the other grant to make sure that our uh, uh, genomic markers are able to segregate populations of animals outside of our study population uh, that are uh, superior in terms of genetics for fertility. We will also genotype sires that are currently in use that have either high or low uh, markers, uh, high or low daughter fertility, in, and to make sure that we can segregate those two populations of sires. So we, it gives us confidence that our markers are predictive of improved uh, reproduction in dairy cattle populations. So we, are, we have complete the uh, database collection. Uh, we have uh, uh, complete the extraction of all our samples. We are now in the phase of genotyping uh, the select populations of animals. Uh, obviously, we continue to conduct extension and education programs. But as our grant evolves and our project evolves in the next two years, we hope to develop uh, uh, genome uh, estimated breeding values that can be used by uh, dairy producers uh, to improve genetic selection uh, for fertility combined with genetic selection for animal health and uh, production. So I want to thank those of you who uh, attend this uh, webinar today. I want to acknowledge my colleagues and the numerous universities that have worked uh, uh, on this grant. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, I want to thank both Jose and Joe today for presenting materials as far as where their grants are and where they um, plan to go and, and how that material will be applicable to our dairy industry. I also want to thank both grants for their support of DairyXNet, um, of delivery of materials that we've had over the last three years and the next two years, very much contingent on um, helping them deliver this material out in the United States and internationally as far as not only the results they have, but also the materials of DairyXNet also. So thank you both and your teams for that support. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, for those of you that would like to complete a survey and um, give us suggestions as far as materials that we could have webinars on, please complete that. 
Also, please visit our archives and view um, this webinar and um, also other webinars that we've had in our series. Well, thank you very much.